Good morning, Times Square Church Summit Campus. What a blessing to see you today. We live in a generation and in a society that it doesn't take a whole lot to be aware of that we live in a divided nation. That we live in a time where families are divided, where neighborhoods are divided. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot to go on a social media and maybe read an article and then read some comments, what people post there, and, and, and to be aware of what is going on. Of how people are just angry, upset, and jealous, and, and to the point of, of hatredism. And we live in a society where the Word of God is calling me and you to love one another, to live in peace, to seek to, seek to live in peace with everyone. And to take an effort from our part to do what is possible as Christians to live according to the Bible. And today it has been on my heart to share a passage from the Word of God that many of us are aware of. But the story I'm about to share shows what people are capable and of how sin affects our lives. What people without God are capable of doing and how sin affects our life. And this story began in the whole beginning. Sometimes we think that, oh, maybe 2,000 years ago before Jesus came and died on a cross, maybe this is when wickedness started. Or maybe this when people became depraved and, and all of these things. But it actually started from the first family. It actually started from the whole beginning. And the title of my message that I would like to share with you today, it is Jealousy Leads to Murder. Jealousy leads to murder. I would like to ask you if you have your Bible or your electronic devices, if you can open up to Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have occurred a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the, pro and in the, pro in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit to the grounds of, to the Lord. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. In a different words, the Lord received Abel's offering. But he did not respect or receive Cain's and his offering. And Cain was very angry. And his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be uh, uh, accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And it desires is for you. But you should rule over it. Or another translation says, you should take dominion over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vengeful, you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is great that I can bear, greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out of this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finds him should kill him. What a powerful story. And there is so much in this story that, that uh, it just speaks to us. Abel was the second child born into the world, but the first one to obey. Think about that. 
He was the second child to be born in the family, but was the first one to obey. And his obedience actually costed his life. So often we think that, you know what, if I obey and if I do what I'm asked to do, you know, what is it going to do to us? Often you might be persecuted. You see, he wanted to obey God and actually costed his life. And today, as I mentioned, that I would like to talk about the jealousy that comes into our life sometimes or it can come. And I'm not perfect. We're all not perfect. From time to time, we will deal with things in our life. And today, the point of this message for us to be aware for us to be aware when we go through things in life, when we encounter things in life, especially that they will live in, for us to be aware of these principles and to be reminded that we don't want to take the path that Cain took. We don't want to take the path that Cain took, but we want to take the path that Abel took, even though it might cost us a lot, but it will be a rewarding path because that's the path that the Lord will accept. Amen. The first point that I would like to share with you is comparing yourself to others. And I believe that this is one of the things that happen in their life. Cain began to compare himself to his brother. Now in verse 2, if you can look again in chapter 4 of Genesis, verse 2 says this. Then she bore again his, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep. Cain was a tiller of the ground. And, and just in this verse, it just tells me that, you know what? It might seem that somebody was working harder than the other one. It might seem like that, right? And often we compare ourselves to other people. Uh, Cain was working, he was a farm boy. As if some of you here are involved in farming, you know that it involves a lot of physical labor. It involves a lot of strength. It involves early mornings and late nights. And you cannot skip, I'm just going to cruise through and, and just kind of skip one week and go do what I want and then come back. Weeds are going to come in, right? And it, it, it's just so much dedication has to be from the farmer perspective towards the land that he's taking care of. And this is what was Cain's life. He was a farmer. He was tilling. He was working so hard to produce the crops and to invest so much into the labor. He was busy. He was a busy guy. And now you have Abel. He was just watching over sheep. Maybe Cain was looking at him sometimes with envy and be like, what in the world are you sitting on that rock? Why can't you come and help me? You're just watching the sheep. What an easy job you have. And look at me how hard I'm working out. Look at how hard I'm putting all my time and energy into this farm. And you're just a shepherd. I'm guilty of that. Sometimes I might look to other people and I'm like, what in the world are you doing with your life? I want to tell you what I do with my schedule, what, the times that I put in and the hours that I put in, the early mornings, the late evenings, the family and all of those things. And, 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 and something cripples in my heart without even knowing that, you know what, some type of like unhealthy jealousy comes into the heart, cripples in, and if we're not careful, it takes roots. You know what? God did not call us to compare ourselves to others. But he called us to walk before him and to be faithful what he has entrusted in our hands. And one day we will give an account with what I did being a shepherd or being a farmer. It's not about the quantity of things we do, but the quality of things that we're entrusted and our faithfulness to it. Often we think that if we're just busy, that is a sign of us just walking, being faithful. But it might not be. It might not be. And then what it causes us, if we're not careful, to look at people that might have a little bit of a different pace in life. And we begin to compare ourselves to them and jealousy can cripple in. And if we're not careful of this jealousy that comes, can come in, it can take roots and lead us actually to murder somebody in our hearts. And the Bible talks about that, which we'll talk later. But isn't it amazing that it, it just seems like it's not fair. I work so hard. It's not fair I'm a farmer. It's not fair that I have to work under the sun. And now you see my brother just hanging out with the sheep and maybe finding uh, shade under the trees and watching the sheep. And he doesn't have a whole lot of effort in it. But it was a condition of the heart. Amen. It is so important. It's so important. This actually story reminds me of the prodigal son. 
If you know or are familiar with the story from the New Testament, how Jesus was sharing his heart, saying a parable, and it was a moment when the older brother, when he looked and saw all the joy that the prodigal son brought back home when he came home, the party that they had, the father, they just put the party and the dancing and the shouts, and, and he began to what? Envy in his heart. He began to be angry. All of these years I gave it to you and you did not do this for me. But now you're doing this for this guy who didn't do a whole lot in life. If anything, he wasted his life and now you're rejoicing. And sometimes the people, the brothers and sisters, God forbid we can be in a place like that. When we look at our lives and we measure our faithfulness as a favor that God has to use our life. We measure our dedication to what we do as a way of God maybe having a special, special way just to you. But not to anybody else, but just to you. And then when we see somebody maybe that messed up, that fell, that maybe just the history is not the best. And all of a sudden God brings them back home and what a rejoicing it is. And God empowers them, their life to do great things for his kingdom. And us as Christians, we should be rejoicing. But often this jealous, God, I, I served you all my life and what is going on? I work so hard, but it's not happening in my life. And we have to be careful of that because it just desires to cripple in our hearts. But we have to say, God, I walk before you. I walk before you. And you know my heart and you know my ways. And as I said that from time to time, I have to check my heart. I have to check my motives. I have to check what I do with my life. And to be able to say, God, help me to keep my eyes on the cross. Because if I take my eyes from the cross, often we hear sermons that the moment you take your eyes from the cross, you're looking for salvation elsewhere. But I also want to share that if you take your eyes from the cross, you're looking at other people to compare yourself to other people. And this can be also, how good am I doing or how bad am I doing? But our walk with the Lord is between us and Him. And the Word of God is the lamp to our feet. It is the path to our life. It is the Word of God and we have to challenge our lives with the Word of God. And stay accountable, stay under authority and walk with Him to fulfill His Word. Amen. The second thing I would like to share with you is check your motives. We have to check our motives why we do what we do. And let's turn again to Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. He says this. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why have your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And it desires is for you. But you should rule over it or take dominion over it. Again, over here it says, God is speaking to Cain and says, listen, if you do well, if your motives are correct, if your motives are to serve, if your motives is to bring this offering and to please me, if you do well, wouldn't this be accepted? So it was not sometimes people think, well, it's about what Cain brought before God. But the way I see it is the condition of his heart, is the motives that he had. It is those motives when he came before the Lord and he was bringing all this offering. And God says, listen, if, if you do well, if you meant well, wouldn't I receive your offering? But there is something deeper that nobody can see. He doesn't say that sin lies right in front of you and it's your brother. He doesn't say that. But he says sin lies at the heart of your, at your door, at, at your heart. Inside of you where nobody sees, nobody knows it. It is this sin that wants to, to come in and take dominion and, and power over your life. And I'm warning you now that listen, it is there. It's knocking in your door. It wants to take over your life. But you know what? On your own you cannot do it. But you have something that I can give you. The power that I can give you to take dominion over this sin. So in different words, Cain, he had a choice. He had a choice to make. Will I obey God? I mean, God is talking to him. It's not a pastor. It's not just your friend is kind of just telling you, hey, get it right. 
And sometimes we want to hear God. And this guy is hearing the voice of God talking to him. And still, he's so embittered and he's so hurt. He's such a jealousy to root in his life that no longer he can even accept the voice of God. That's a dangerous place to be. When God says forgive, when God is speaking through the word of God into our lives and says adjust something, do something about this or that, and no longer we are willing to do that because we have allowed jealousy, bitterness, and unforgiveness to take root in our life. It's amazing. It's amazing how much damage that can do. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says this, guard your heart above all things. For, this, for it determines the course of your life. Our heart and the desire of our heart will determine the course of our life. That's how important our heart is. And that's why he says you guard your heart. Guard your heart. Protect your heart. There are things in life that want to take dominion over you and are not in your heart. But you have to protect your heart. Protect your heart. From what you hear, from what you see, from the places you go to, the friends you hang out with. Protect your heart. It is sacred. This is where the life and death is in the words, but our words come from our heart. And it says the course of your life will be determined according to what's in your heart. What kind of things we entertain ourselves. But he says protect your heart. The number three that I would like to share, it is... This regard to correction. And this will happen, I believe, in his life. As, as in verse 7 I read, it says, sin lies at your door, at your heart. And it desires for you, it wants you, but you take dominion over it. Right? It, it talks about that God is coming and bringing correction in Cain's life. He's saying, listen, there's something going on there that maybe you do not fully see it. But I see, I don't know if he already planned already and he already had in his mind, I'm going to just come and kill my brother and do all these things. I'm not sure, but I know that God knew. I know that God knew the state that Cain is in is a dangerous place to be. And he's warning him that, listen, this is not going to end well for you. I'm going to give you a little correction. And he disregarded the correction from God. And he still did what he wanted to do. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 11 says this, My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. As a grown man now, let me tell you that sometimes it hurts to be disciplined or corrected. And I go in life that I do get disciplined and corrected. At home, in a sense corrected because my wife is the better half of me. It's not in vain they say that it's the better. I don't know why is it the better, right? But it's true, right? The better half. At work, with your bosses, with your leadership. If we want to grow, we have to be open for correction. If we want to grow, we have to be open for correction. But more than that, the Bible says, those who he loves, he corrects. And often we don't want to be corrected because it hurts. And often in the... The society we live in, correction often is perceived as a negative thing. It's almost like we're going to correct you, we're going to catch you, you're going to be in prison, or this is what's going to happen, or this is going to... So, so we have the perception of, cor of correction actually in a negative way. And we push against this idea of being corrected. But you know, it's actually the healthiest thing to do. We correct our children, those who have children, not because we hate them, but because we love them. And we want them to succeed in life. We want them to grow up and to be good people. We want to speak it to our children and, and to be able for them to receive these words because we lived a little bit longer and now we want to invest into their lives. It's so heartbreaking when you hear stories when children do not want to obey parents. When they tell parents actually to shut up and close the doors, hit the doors and leave their homes and they do all these things. And it's so hurtful when we hear stories like that, when it happens with people or friends that we know. But how much we do it to our Heavenly Father. Maybe we don't tell Him to shut up, but by our actions we're saying, God, I, I don't want to hear you correct me because I want to do what I want to do in life. But His correction comes in love actually. 
the correction that comes from our Heavenly Father, it's because He loves me and you so much that He wants me and you to prosper in His ways. Now, it doesn't mean that we will not have trials. But what it means is that we will experience His love even in the midst of failure. It's not going to be a validation of our wrongdoing, but it's going to be His Holy Spirit knocking in our hearts and causing us to bring conviction and causing us to come out of those places to honor Him. And it's because He loves us. He loves me and you. And that's why He brings correction. It's not a negative thing. It is a positive thing. And the more He does that, the more we grow in Christ. Amen. The fourth point that I would like to share is the anger that we face sometimes. The undealt anger. You know, the Bible says that be angry, right? But only for a season, small season. Don't let the sun come down in your anger. So it doesn't say, listen, you have to be perfect. Don't, don't ever get angry. We fail. We do get angry. But it says that undealt anger and jealousy leads to secret murders that becomes public. Undealt anger, undealt jealousy, undealt forgiveness in our life will lead to secret murders that often and always will come public. And now you're probably thinking, what are you talking about? Well, let's open up again to the same chapter. And let's look together verse 8. And verse 8 says this. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. It's amazing, right? So now I want you to take an, 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 a moment and kind of imagine this. Two brothers are walking together in the field and they're talking. I don't know what they're talking. It doesn't say the details of the conversation. But, but it doesn't say that, you know, they're not talking. Often sometimes people say, well, if I'm offended by somebody or I offended somebody, or, you know, if, I, if I'm angry or if I can't stand somebody, the conversation usually ends, right? There usually the, no conversation. We're not talking. You live on that side of the town. I'm going to live on this side of the town. And often this is what we experience. But over here, we see that they're talking. What a dangerous place to be when you're talking with somebody, but in your heart you're murdering them. When you're actually with somebody hanging out and doing things, but deep in secret in your heart, you're planning things against them. The betrayal of friendship, the betrayal of, fr of brothers and sisters. And it comes to a moment when you're, you're getting to a place where you're finding things out and, and, you, and, and you're kind of like gathering information. And all of a sudden, just you flip on people. All of a sudden, you murder them in your, in, in your heart. What a dangerous place it is to be, to walk with a brother and sister on the field, but in your heart you know that you know what, I'm, I'm about to do something to them. And this is, the, this is the danger that if we're not careful with the roots of the first point and second and third that I talked about, it will lead us to the fourth point. That undealt anger and jealousy will lead you to a secret murder in your heart. And verse 8 says this. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field, and this talks to me, again, when they were in a field, it reminds me that they were away. Maybe their parents did not see them. It, it was a secret place, actually. It was maybe a place where, where Cain was angry and, and, and reminded him again of the field and the things that he brought before the Lord, but it was not received. And now again, it's on that field of, of being together, it being away. That Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. In the morning I was sharing my family what I'm going to share today. And my five-year-old daughter says, yeah, Cain took a big rock and killed Abel. <laughs> you know, she saw probably pictures <laughs> on, on, the, on the movies, I don't know what. But, but it's, it, it, it's amazing that even children understand that, you know what, it was a hatredism that rose in his life and he killed him. And it's such a picture that reminds me and you today that if we are not dealing with things that are little in life, they can become bigger. If we are not dealing with things when situation comes, when family comes together and something somebody said and all of a sudden we're offended or a brother and sister, it will affect us. First John 
chapter 3, verse 15 says this. Anyone who hates a brother or a sister is a murderer. That's, that is crazy. It doesn't say uh, maybe if you hate them, you have a past. Uh, you can justify your hatredism. I don't see that in the Bible. It says that anyone who hates his brother and sister is a murderer. And it so shocked me that Cain killed his brother, Abel. It was not just his neighbor or, or kind of like a heathen from the world. It says that Cain killed his brother, Abel. And now in 1 John, the Word of God is calling me and reminding us. It says, listen, if you hate your brother, in the body of Christ, we are what? Brothers and sisters. Often we can, oh, I don't know what he talks about. He doesn't talk about the world. He talks about us, the body of Jesus Christ. He talks about us. And I was doing a little study and I began to take some notes of some commentaries and people that began to just comment on this story. And I would like to share a few thoughts that they shared about Cain. It says that when disappointed, he reacted in anger. How much in our life when we're disappointed, we react in anger. And this is what he was. He was disappointed that God did not receive his offering. I worked so hard on the field. I put so many hours. I had so much sweat. I, I did all those things. And, and now you look at this dude who's sitting under the tree watching the sheep. No effort. Cruising through life. And you receive his offering. But all of my labor, it's in vain. And because of the disappointment, he forgot that he's walking before the Lord. That God is going to come and, 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 and give him a reward. It's not, it's not the family, but it was God. And because of his disappointment, as a result, anger got a hold of him. He took the negative option, even though God gave him a way. When God says sin lays at your door, it, it, it speaks to me that, you know what? He had a choice. He had a choice to go the other direction. God was there to help him in that. But even when he had the option to go the other way, he still chose to go his way. That's crazy. That is crazy what men are capable of doing without God, without the direction of the Word of God. And because of that, he became the first murderer in history of the world. And he continued from there on. We still experience people murdering each other and killing each other. And it's because it takes roots in our hearts sometimes. The unforgiveness, the hatred, and the comparison, the jealousy, all of these things. The neighbors, maybe he might have a nicer thing than you do. And all of a sudden this jealousy comes, right? It starts from little things, crazy things. But it leads us to... Be captivated by fear, by comparison, by anger, by unforgiveness. And when you go back, it's almost kind of like a childish thing that started. But it revolved like a ball because he did not take care of it when God was there to help him. Anger is not necessarily a sin. As I mentioned, the New Testament, he says, in your anger, right, don't live always there. But we can get angry from time to time. And but seek forgiveness, seek reconciliation. But it says, anger is not necessarily a sin, but actions motivated by anger can be sinful. That is crazy. Anger in itself is not necessarily a sin. It's how we deal with it, right? But it's the actions motivated by our anger are sinful. And that what is just mind-boggling, that we are not to act in our anger. But let us cool down. Let us go and spend time with prayer, in prayer. And ask God to help us. Anger should be the energy behind good actions, not evil. Sometimes when we get angry, we are to be reminded, oh man, what am I going to be capable of doing if I stay in this anger? And actually when we do it, get angry and upset or or fall down sometimes that can be actually the motivation to not do evil not to act upon that but actually to do good 
to say, no, no, I'm going to run to God and He's going to help me. And now Abel, he's mentioned in the hall of faith. That's the difference between Cain and Abel, right? He's mentioned in the hall of faith. Often if you watch baseball or football or all these things, it comes a moment that people did well, all of a sudden they're in the hall of fame. And people try to be so crazy to be in the hall of fame. But we as the church of Jesus Christ, we're not in the hall of fame, but we are going to be in the hall of faith. Because it's by faith we walk with the Lord. It is by faith we overcome things. It is by faith when we come to Him, we walk victorious. He was the first shepherd. And it's crazy that as He was the first shepherd, so to speak. And He was killed because of jealousy, because of anger and forgiveness and bitterness. Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, also was killed of similar things. Jesus Christ came as a good shepherd to seek me and you. And because of similar things of anger from Pharisees and, and, and the unforgiveness and the bitterness and all of the confusion and all those things and our sin killed him on a cross. But that could not hold him down but he rose again for our righteousness, our justification, for me and you to have hope in him. It's amazing. First martyr for truth. He was the first martyr for truth. And he continues and will continue till Jesus Christ dies. The, the, the Jesus Christ comes that Christians will be murdered for truth. Because the truth actually sets us free. And when it sets us free from inside out, we understand that our home is in heaven. It's not here. And even though we might be killed, even though we might be dismayed, we have a bigger purpose. And that's why this principle that I shared that, that cannot captivate us and hold us down because it's going to be the purpose. But we are going to walk in truth like Abel did. God hears those who come to Him and ask Him to help Him and to forgive. And when we come with our lives before Him, He receives us. Amen. And I would like to read the scripture that is written in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4. It says this, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gift. And through it, he being dead still speaks. What a powerful, powerful scripture. That him being dead, he still speaks. Today, right now, he still speaks. That's the path of righteous people. That's the path of people that choose to go with God. They choose to put offenses and all of these things aside even though we battle from day to day, week to week, month to month and year to year. We battle, we're all in those journeys at times. But what I'm talking about and to myself, don't allow these things to take root in your life. You will destroy you. You try to destroy me, my family, my wife and I've seen friends of mine. It is there. We're dealing with this reality. But I'm reminding you that we're not to allow to take root in our life. And if we don't, our life will be marked speaking to other people of the testimony and the faithfulness of God. Hallelujah. I would like to conclude with this scripture. And this will be my altar call. That Psalm 139 verse 23 and 24 says this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offense way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Another translation says this. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. But for some reason I love the verse that it says, see if there is any offensive way in me. Are you offended? I am at times. I just want to move mountains to prove somebody wrong. Find the truth, so to speak, what is called truth in my mind. But what I've learned lately, what I'm going in life and the journey that I'm going in, that God, when I come to you and I pray and I open my desires to you, you will protect me. You will lead me. 
you will guide me and always the truth wins and when we have that understanding when we come to him and 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 it, we're not defending ourselves but we allow him to defend us if there's something to defend <laughs> but often there is none to defend and this is when he comes in love and corrects us and we are also to receive this in love because he loves us that's why he corrects us for us to grow but he says see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me take me away from those things and lead me into the way everlasting father we thank you for who you are we thank you for your word that has power to speak into our lives and to remind us that you are faithful to remind us that you desire for us to walk in victory lord we reject jealousy from our life we reject unforgiveness we reject bitterness that leads to murder not necessarily physically but your word says in the new testament that when we hate a brother or a sister we are murderers already in our hearts lord those secret places in our homes in our close friendships in the surroundings we face from day to day and we hang out with help us oh lord those secret places came to his brother Abel into the field talking with him and then he murdered him there protect us oh God not to be people like that but to walk in truth protect us oh God and would you lead us and guide our lives Lord as the psalmist says search me oh God would you search us today would you search this church today it is your church we're your body Lord, we come to you, not because we are afraid, but because we are confident in you, that you desire the best for us. And know our hearts. Test us, oh God, and know our ways. Know our anxious thoughts. See, oh God, if there is any offensive or wicked ways in us. And lead us now, oh God, to the way of everlasting life. Lead us to you, oh Father. Forgive us in the moments when we fail. Forgive us in the moments when we held on to offenses for so long that it actually brought bitterness in our lives and captivated us and paralyzed us to walk in you in freedom. Lord, would you help us now? Remind us again and again through the power of your word that you love us. That's why you are reminding us to walk in freedom. And this walk, as Abel walked in faith, he was written in the book of Hebrews. He became a testimony of people that overcome things by faith. And often it will cost us and it might even cost our lives. But it's worth it all. We're not interested in the hall of fame, but we're interested to walk with you in the hall of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me please? If this word spoke to you, would you come and join me here up front? And we're just going to pray together. If there's anything in your heart that you need to lay it down and leave it at the altars before the Lord, do this. I beg you, do this. It's for your good. You're not going to look silly by coming here. You will look silly if you keep this in your life because it will destroy your life. But give it all to Jesus Christ. And He said that He will give you life and life in abundance. Amen.